Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. This is Wisdom Wednesday, and every Wednesday we study the book of Proverbs. And if you have not seen the previous uh, studies on this, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you will go back and watch the, the other episodes. Right now, we're on chapter 16, and we're going to pick up with verse 26 today. Uh, I expect to get through chapter 16 and, and possibly maybe finish chapter 17 today. Um, okay, but first let me ask our Brother Eric to introduce himself, say hi, and then we'll, we'll get started. Hello, Brother Luke and uh, our viewers. Uh, this is the homo, and uh, I'm... Uh, so very glad to be here uh, with Brother Luke today. Okay, that's you, Brother Luke. Okay, if you don't know Brother Eric, uh, his YouTube channel is Dehalmo, D-E-H-A-L-L-M-O. I hope you will subscribe to his channel. Okay, let's get started now. Um, chapter 16, verse 26. I read it first in the KJV. And then if, it's, if I think it, it may be helpful, I will also look at it in the Amplified Version. Um, verse 26, He that laboreth, laboreth for himself, for his mouth craveth it of him. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is a burning fire. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends well there's that they're not all it's not one flowing idea it looks like um, three different ideas here uh, let's look at verse 26 first um, he that laboreth laboreth for himself for his mouth craveth it of him i'll read that in the amplified see if it uh, is helpful the appetite of a worker works for him for his hunger urges him on all right, brother, uh, what do you have to say about that verse? Well, Brother Luke, uh, if we didn't have to eat, we wouldn't have to work. Yeah, I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul said, that uh, if you're not willing to work, then you should not eat. You should not receive any food. And uh, there, are, there are people that... Uh, and I guess there's always been people like that. And there probably always will be. Jesus said, we'll always have the poor with us. I think that he's talking about in before we get into eternity with the new heaven and new earth. Of course, at that time, we'll have no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. And so none of these things like laziness and, and starvation and hunger and all these things will exist then. But until then, we're going to always have some people that are poor and many times the cause for for being poor is laziness and uh, so if, if a person is not willing to be or, or work then should we just take care of that person and that, that seems to be the way the the united states of america society has been moving over the last few decades that uh, someone doesn't have to work and we'll just feed them and give them everything they need whether they work or not what do you think of that? Well, uh, Brother Luke, uh, I think the government ought to support me uh, because I'm doing the work of the Lord. <laughs> well, it does say that uh, the uh, the oxen should you know should not be muzzled. Um, if you're if we are working for the Lord then and it certainly is a, a labor that and it's no reason why someone should not be compensated for it the apostle paul was very careful though to never accept compensation for his ministry he never wanted to be accused of being in the ministry just for the money and i think the apostle peter also wrote about that talking about people who are in it just for the filthy lucre just that their only reason for being in the ministry is is to make money and we see that a lot in america today there's a lot of 
very big churches, very giant ministries, and the, the pastors are making fortunes. And I'm very suspicious that their real reason for getting into it is for, as Peter said, filthy lucre. Brother, back to you. Amen to that, Brother Luke. And uh, uh, I've uh, paid special attention to uh, most of this uh, funny business going on, and I've come to find out that most times uh, they're preaching a false gospel. So uh, we want to correct them in their false gospel. And it's very difficult once they, they most of them do realize they are preaching a false gospel, but they have no way of, uh, they don't know how they're going to get out of it. Okay, well, we have the solution. We have multiple solutions, and we will be presenting them uh, to these individuals as a way out of their uh, heresies uh, and enable for them to save face. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Yes, amen. It is true that uh, a lot of these giant churches today, uh, unfortunately, they are successful fight financially, but they're not preaching the true message of salvation. And we will be, I'm sure, discussing it throughout the study. Uh, and we certainly will end on that subject. We want everyone to know the true message of salvation. Uh, but this idea of uh, uh, being lazy and or, or working and being fed, um, uh, I, I don't want to veer off into a political uh, uh, discussion here, but, but I, I do believe that as a society, we should provide a safety net for people who need it. If, if someone gets too old or too sick and, and they're disabled and they're, they're not able to support themselves as a society, we need to help them out. Uh, we, we don't want someone to be sick and not get health care. We don't want someone to be... Uh, poor and without and not be able to even have afford food we want to be able to feed them but if someone is able-bodied it would be really a shame to just provide everything for them they're able-bodied and they don't have to work for it because it just takes away their their need the the, the necessity for for working and without that then uh, our old human nature though says hey why should I work if I can get everything for free and it, it, it our, our system will crumble down on the, under the weight of that kind of socialism. Uh, brother, before we go on to the next verse, do uh, you want to add anything to that? Um, I would just like to say that uh, the, uh, the gospel is good news to the poor. And so uh, we will be taking the gospel to the poor uh, before us, and uh, we will be successful uh uh, everything we do after that, and that's uh, according to scriptures, uh, and that will be in feeding the poor and clothing the poor and uh, uh, everything else uh, to take care of the poor's needs. Okay, that's the Yeah, uh, I would say that in ministry, uh, a person could err on, on two extremes. And one extreme would be that we only focus on feeding and clothing people and then we ne neglect to do what's really most important is to offer them the gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. What good is it to feed and clothe and care for people's uh, temporal needs if we know that in eternity they're, they're lost? So um, that would be a big error. But on the other hand, we can go to the other extreme where we, we focus only on salvation and uh, we fail to help people who need it now. Um, and um, I saw, I saw a, uh, a mural, I think, on, on a church wall once, and, and it said, uh, it said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so there is a place for for a, a, a person is much more likely to be wanting to listen to us about the Bible and about Jesus if they know that we care enough about them to feed them and clothe them and help them in their needs, you know? Uh, so I think you can go to extremes on either side of that question as far as uh, our, our primary ministry is to, to uh, give them the gift of salvation 
but it doesn't mean that we should neglect uh, all the other kinds of things that are, are needful and helpful. All right, let's go on to uh, the next verse is uh, uh, 20, verse 27. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and his lips there is as a burning fire. I'll look at that in the Amplified. It says, a worthless man devises and digs up evil, and the words of his lips are like a scorching fire. All right, brother. What do you say about that? Okay, brother Luke. Now, an ungodly man evil. In his lips there is as a burning fire. Well, I suspect that's uh, uh, hinting at uh, uh, activities uh, such as uh, gossip. When, when people gossip, they're digging up evil. And that gossip is like a burning fire, right? That burning fire destroys uh, uh, reputations and such. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think gossip uh, could fall under that uh, umbrella of uh, the, these words. These, how is it phrased there? Uh, uh, the words of his lips are like a scorching or burning fire. The words of our lips, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Proverbs and, and uh, King Solomon, you know, he talks a lot about our lips, our tongue, uh, the power of the tongue. Uh, I can't remember if it was Solomon or, or Paul that talked about the, the power of the tongue and uh, the, a, a woman's tongue, the power of that to, to destroy. So what we say can be either uplifting and enlightening or it could it could really be destructive like a, a burning fire uh, and it could be gossip it could just be uh, mean cruel things we say to hurt each other so we really have to be really careful what comes out of our mouth and jesus said it's it's not what we put in our mouth that defiles us it's what comes out of our mouth that's it it's don't be concerned about the food you're eating being, uh, you know, uh, you know, like uh, in, in some religions, they're strict about what foods you can and cannot have, but that that's not really the issue. The issue is what's coming out of our mouth because what we say reflects what's in our heart, as Jesus said. All right, brother, we'll move on about the next one verse, but I can give you another chance to comment further on that if you want. Uh, that's okay. Continue on. All right, so verse uh, 28, a froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I shouldn't be laughing. This is really, really a horrible idea here. We're look, considering, and it's. Uh, I'm laughing because I... I, I've seen this happen so much. Uh, a froward man soweth strife. There's so much strife uh, within this, uh, on the internet, uh, among believers and non-believers, and even in within the community of believers, uh, we have strife even among us. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to me. Uh, the um, there there are some things that are worth fighting over the core doctrines of Christianity uh, I will I will fight for those things and if if we if there's strife over those things then I, I think that it's a a righteous uh, righteous uh, fight that we, we carry on for for the true message of salvation uh, but uh, there's a hundred other theological questions that are don't rise to that level and we should be able to discuss them and and still love each other and not have strife even if we don't agree on all these other things but there's there's too much strife in the body and a whisper separated the chief friends uh yeah this is a person that's he's uh wants to stir up trouble 
and uh, he's sowing strife and he's trying to divide friends from each other. I've, I've had that happen. I've, I've lost a lot of friends on YouTube because of some individuals start trying to stir up trouble and cause strife between us. And sadly, uh, they have succeeded to a certain extent. I'm going to look at it in the Amplified, but first let me to ask you to comment on that. Uh, okay, Brother Luke, um, I have a confession to make. Uh, I probably have been guilty of uh, having more people quit YouTube than anybody else and having been blocked by more people than anybody else. But it wasn't my intention ever to offend anybody. But uh, I believe offensives uh, will come. It's how we deal with them. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Okay, uh, I'm going to look at this in the Amplified now, too. Um, a, a perverse man spreads strife. Froward, it says in the KJV, froward or perverse man. Um, froward to me is someone who is like a negative person, uh, just that is uh, just bringing negativity and uh, criticism into, into the situation. Uh, a perverse man spreads strife. He's spreading it. He, he delights in it. He wants strife. He wants people arguing. And one who gossips separates intimate friends. Um, I think you... Um, um, I'm not sure that uh, your confession there is as serious as you, you make it out. Uh, I, I don't see you as a person that is... Uh, uh, sowing divisions uh, but uh, I don't know if you want to explain that any further or not but I don't that's not the way I, I perceive your brother well Dr. Luke, I just like to take this opportunity to uh, extend an olive branch to anyone that I may have ever offended and uh, I would like to commune with Christ and with them as one, if they would uh, be willing to do that with me, uh, I will uh, consider it uh, done. Okay, back to you. Okay, well, let's move on to now <clears throat> verse uh, 29. A violent man enticeth his neighbor and lead him into the way that is not good. He shutteth his eyes to devise froward things. Moving his lips, he bringeth evil to pass. Um, I know there are, I mean, fortunately, I, I've encountered a lot of the people uh, that the previous verse has described a froward person that wants to stir up strife. I haven't encountered really very many violent people. Uh, fortunately, I, I don't want to encounter violent people. Um, I have had some people in my direct evangelism where I'm talking to people not on the internet, but directly, particularly in, in street evangelism. I've had some people get violent. They've thrown objects at me. They've spit upon me. They've threatened me with physical violence. And um, so that, but it's a, it's a rare thing, but I, I've experienced it. If you do, if you do evangelism enough, even if you're trying to do your evangelism in uh, what I think is the right way, uh, talking about the love that Jesus has for them, and, and instead of condemning them, calling them names, calling them sinners and condemning them and, and, and uh, that, that kind of wit, uh, evangelism is, is not really even evangelism. It's just rebuking and name calling. But um, even, even if you're careful to present the gospel in the most loving, kind, gentle way you can, you're still, unfortunately, some people are going to be so offended by the name of Jesus that they... It, it stirs them up so much, their anger, that they end up wanting to be violent. Uh, 
but I'm glad to say that uh, I don't encounter violent people in my life very often. Brother, before we go on, anything else on that? Uh, well, Brother Luke, uh, I uh, agree with you, uh, and the scripture agrees with you on uh, what you just stated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, verse 31, the hoary head is a crown of glory. Now that word hoary is spelled H-O-A-R-Y. The hoary head is a crown of glory. If it be found in the way of righteousness. Well, I have no what I have no idea what hoary means in that sense. A hoary head, but says it's the crown of glory. I'm, I can look at the amplified, but I want to see see if you can comment on it. If you understand this better than I do. It was also once a mystery to me as well, Brother Luke, but I've come to learn that it means uh, pretty much uh, uh, white gray hair. Yeah, in the, in the Amplified, it says, verse 31, the silver-haired head is a crown of splendor and glory. That's good. I'm... I always enjoy learning a new word. Uh, to me, the most impressive person I've ever met, and I've and I've met people who are, uh, you know, uh, very very educated uh, people, very successful people, uh, uh, through in Christianity and outside of Christianity, and, and yet there's one person that stands out to me with oh, his vocabulary that exceeds anybody else by far. And it's uh, Brother Jack Smack. Uh, sometimes, though, his vocabulary is is so advanced that it's over our heads. And even though personally I, I, I'm an educated person, sometimes uh, words are beyond me too, and I have to take time to stop and look it up. Like this word "hoary," I didn't know it meant silver-haired a person. Um, but Brother Jack Smack, uh, he's uh, when I listen to him, there's a lot of times he uses words that I don't know what they mean. I have to stop and look them up. It's always a pleasure learning learning new words, though. But in the, in the uh, uh, the amplifier says the silver-haired head is a crown of splendor and glory. It is found in the way of righteousness. Um, brother, I'm uh, see my beard. This little silver hair i've got some gray hairs too it's not completely gray but there's a little gray in my hair now so uh this is some kind of crown of glory it says and i think that it's it's a reference to age uh, because uh you normally your hair turns gray as you get older and as we get older it we should have accumulated more knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. It's not always the case that someone who's older is always wiser. But I think this is what this verse is alluding to. If someone has silver hair, hoary haired person, uh, they're older, they should be wiser. It should be a clown of glory and righteousness because hopefully as we get older, <laughs> we learn from our mistakes and we, we're getting better. Uh, before I go on, brother, what do you, you say about that? Yes, absolutely, brother Luke. And uh, uh, I have you know that uh, Cinderella has told me that my hair uh, is looking just as you subscribed, as well as Prince Charming's hair is uh, also. <laughs> so uh, uh, your uh, your hoary head. Is uh, is that a true reflection of, of your uh, righteousness and, and wisdom now? Yes, Brother Luke. That's always our goal here in Magic Fairy Dust Land. <laughs> okay. All right, let's move on. Um, back to the KJV in verse 32. He that is slow to anger... Is better than the all better better than the mighty, 
and he that ruleth his spirit uh, than he that taketh a city. Wow. That's a very powerful, powerful verse, I think. Um, I'm going to give you first chance to elaborate on it. Let me just read it very slowly again. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Brother? Okay, Brother Lee. Uh, that's talking about uh, the poor old man that wants to save the city through his wisdom, and nobody knew about it. Uh, it tells of that also somewhere uh, later on in the Proverbs. But this verse reminds me of that uh, story. The um, what does it mean here when it says that uh, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty? Uh, there's other verses in in uh, Proverbs that that makes this same point, and there's a verse in James uh, that I like that says, uh, uh, "Be be." Uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Um, but I think this concept of being slow to anger um, is is not natural. Um, I think the the, the 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 natural reaction I see in people, and that I have had in my life too, is that we we get angry too quickly. And, and, and uh, sometimes anger is, is justified. Uh, there is such a thing as you know, righteous anger, righteous indignation. Uh, but most of the time when we get, do get angry, it's not righteous anger. And it, 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 it's just, it's, it's uh, carnal anger. And we, we, mankind, we all tend, whether we're lost or saved, we, we all tend to get angry too quickly, too easily. Um, so it says that he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of mighty people. Um, by mighty, I'm talking that that would be a person that has a lot of power, like uh, a king that has power, or uh, a government authority, like a, a president or a governor, or some, uh, great men of business, great who have great wealth. Uh, these are mighty people. They have a lot of power with wealth and and uh, political power, and yet. If you are slow to anger, it says that you're better than them. Uh, it seems to me that that's something to really desire. Uh, so I, I think that uh, it would be wise to add that to our prayers. So, Lord, help me to be slow to anger. Can, can, uh, I don't want to start getting angry quickly and losing my temper all the time. Uh, and, and that... Uh, and the follow-up part it says, "And he that ruleth his spirit, then it it would it it, it means that it's better." It's just, it's a follow-up on the first idea, comparing this. He that ruleth his spirit is better than he that taketh the city. I mean, I mean, if you can take a city, if you can capture a city because of your power, your mighty army, uh, but he that ruleth his spirit, uh, your uh, again, our spirit. Our human nature is carnal, and if we can rule over that spirit and restrain it. Now, through the flesh, we can't do that, but through the Holy Spirit, we can do that. And Paul talks about, uh, in Corinthians, he, he, he talks about the Corinthian church being carnal. And he says that you're babes in Christ, so you truly are Christians, but you're not mature, you're immature Christians, and you're still carnal. He says, but but not just you, even me. He, Paul says, even I am and carnal. And he says, I, you know, I, I know I, I want to do the, the right thing, and I, I don't do it. And, and I, I don't want to do bad things, and yet I still do it. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. But he, but he says, it's not really me that's doing it. It's the, it's the sin nature that lives within my flesh. 
and, and he, there's a, he says there's a struggle between this old man that has the sin nature and the new man that's born again child of God, and the new man has the Holy Spirit, and the old man has the, the old spirit uh, of the sin nature, and there's a struggle. So once we get born again, that struggle begins in our life, and wh who will we, who will get the victory? Well, uh, it's up to us to listen to the Holy Spirit and, and not listen to the, the sin nature. And so he says, he that ruleth his spirit is better than, than he that taketh the city. Uh, how do you rule your spirit? Well, you listen to the Holy Spirit that lives inside you. If you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God now lives inside you. And uh, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is in you. It's like the Holy Spirit is connected to your dead spirit. And your dead spirit is quickened and brought to life, regenerated. Now you're spiritually alive. You're born again spiritually. And, and, and now the Holy Spirit wants to start transforming you and changing your ideas and your ways. And... Uh, uh, that's what is, is supposed to happen over the period of your lifetime. You're supposed to be listening to the Spirit and growing and maturing spiritually. So I think that this is verse uh, 32 um, really alludes to all of that. Uh, do you rule your spirit? Uh, you can't do it through the flesh. You have to do it through the Holy Spirit. Uh, brother, before I go on, uh, what do you say about that? Uh, well, Brother Luke, I was just wondering uh, how the spirit of adoption fits in there. Now, perhaps the spirit of adoption applies to the flesh, whereas the new man is born of God. I'd have to look at the verse that says the spirit of adoption. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if that's referring to a spirit in the sense of the Holy Spirit. Or the spirit of adoption, meaning the um, um, you, you do something in a certain spirit. In other words, uh, with a, a certain attitude. Um, so I don't know. I, we could go off and look at that verse and study it better. But uh, um, we are we are spiritually born again as a child of God when we put our faith in Jesus. And this, the Bible says we are adopted. So it's a true new birth spiritually, but it likens it to an adoption because we're, Jesus Christ is the only begotten child of God, son of God. Uh, but you and I are not begotten as the sons of God, but we are adopted as sons of God. So there's a great distinction. We cannot be, even though you're a son of God and I'm a son of God, it's not in the same sense that Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God. Uh, well, I'll move on, but anything else you want to say about that? I sure wish uh, Brother Bill was here to uh, look up those verses for us. Yeah, Brother Bill is good for that and many other things. It would be nice to have him with us, but we'll see. Maybe he'll join us again eventually. Um, I'm going to look at that verse um, 32 in the Amplified here. It says, uh, he who is slow to anger is better and more honorable than the mighty soldier, and he who rules and controls his own spirit than he who captures a city. All right. It's, it's pretty much in agreement with what we've been saying. Uh, so let's look at first, verse 33 uh, in the KJV. It says, the lot is cast into the lap. But the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. My brother, maybe you can explain this to me. I don't get it at all. Now, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Uh, well, Brother Luke, uh, being from Sin City, uh, I would think that you would be uh, more uh, attuned to this. <laughs> But let me give it my best shot. Okay, if this verse has always meant to me that uh, when you're casting the lots, 
that the outcome of that lock casting will be uh, from the Lord. Okay. All right. Let me let me see what the Amplified says about it. And uh, yeah, being in Las Vegas here, I should understand all these things pertaining to casting lots, which is a type of gambling. Let me see. Oh, gosh, I'm looking at, okay, 33. The, the lot is cast into the lap, but it, it's every decision is from the Lord. Well, I think maybe this is why the apostles decided to cast lots to decide who should replace Judas. Uh, they probably applied that principle. Um, as far as I can tell, in, in the, the book of Acts, there's no explanation of uh, why they did it. I, the Lord didn't say to them, in the, in the book of Acts, it doesn't say, the Lord says, now cast lots and determine who's going to take Judas's place. Uh, they, but they did it. So I, I think they took it upon themselves, and maybe they did it because of reading this verse in Proverbs that by casting lots, it'll turn out that God's going to make the lot come out the way that he, he wants it to. And they ended up getting uh, Matthias. And, uh, but you never hear of Matthias again. Uh, the, we, we did get another apostle later, the apostle Paul, that you know was, was a great achiever, uh, probably achieved more than any other, other apostle. <laughs> But the one that was selected through drawing lots, uh, Matthias, I, I don't know of anything else about Matthias other than that one reference to him. Do you? No, Brother Luke. I sure don't. Okay. All right, let's go on now to um, chapter 17. Uh, verse 1 in the KJV, better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Wow. I remember the, this part where uh, Solomon talks about your home and being having a peaceful home, and he's going to start talking about a wife, how, how horrible it is to have a bad wife. Uh, but, um, but this is... Um, this is along that line of thinking. Uh, better is a dry morsel, a dry morsel. Uh, in other words, it's, it's it's food that's not really very appealing. You know, it, it it'll serve its purpose to to give you some nourishment, but it's not desirable to eat. Um, and, and and also quietness. It's better to be just have a nice, quiet, peaceful environment and just boring, dull food. Than, than have a house full of sacrifices with strife. Strife is, uh, I mean, I, I've had strife uh, in, in, in my house in the past. And um, thankfully, after many years of marriage, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, people learn how to get along. My wife and I have learned how to get along. Uh, it took us a lot, a lot of strife, <laughs> working through that strife to get to that point, though. But I know what it's like to have strife and, and how horrible it is. And, and uh, uh, so I, I, I can relate to this verse here. Uh, brother, how about you? Absolutely, Brother Luke. Uh, I can certainly echo your sentiments as well in my own marriage of 28 years with Pocahontas. Well, I'd like to hear Pocahontas' version of all these stories, too, you know, hear her side of it. Okay, Brother Luke, we will arrange that meeting. <laughs> all right. Uh, a wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame. A wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. 
Well, that's a Rubik's Cube verse for me. Uh, maybe you could sort it out, brother. What do you say about that? Let me see what I can do with that. Uh, now, I suspect that that principle is played out somewhere in Scripture. But I'm not sure where at the moment. Uh, I'm going to think about it and I'll get back with you on that. Okay, I'm going to resort to looking at the Amplified, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 2, and see if, if that is helpful. A wise servant will rule over the unworthy son who acts shamefully and brings disgrace to the family. And the, wor and the worthy servant will share in the inheritance among the brothers. Okay, let me read it again more thought thoughtfully. A wise servant will rule over the unworthy son who acts shamefully and brings disgrace to the family. Um, and the worthy servant will share in the inheritance among the brothers. All right, brother, is that helpful? Uh, yes, brother, it is immensely. And I know now uh, what that verse applies to. Uh, that verse applies to where Jesus said, uh, many shall come from the east and the west and the north and the south and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob at his father's table, but the children of the kingdom would be cast out. Uh, yeah, uh, I can see that's that's a spiritual application of it that uh, would apply. Um, I'm going to move on to the uh, next verse in the KJV, 17, verse 3. The fining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. All right, those are two different ideas, so we're taking one at a time. Verse 3 is, the fining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. Okay, brother Luke, that should be obvious to us uh, because Scripture tells us over and over again how uh, uh, God's Word purifies us. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the Psalms and the Proverbs talks about that quite a bit. Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, on, on Sunday, uh, I'm doing character studies and uh, the subject, the, the subject character is, is Job. And this verse would apply to, in Job's case, uh, the, the Lord is putting Job through a test. Um, or it's really Satan that's causing all these things to happen to Job, but, but the Lord gives Satan permission to do these things to Job as a test because, because the Lord is claiming, I be, what about my servant Job? Have you considered him? Because, you know, that Satan's there to accuse all people. And uh, he said, well, what about Job? Do you think he can pass, pass the, t the test when you say that everybody's so horrible and they don't, nobody loves me? And uh, you, you, Satan's saying, well, if you let me take everything away from him, his family, his wealth, his health, his health he'll, he'll certainly curse you. And uh, so the Lord allows Satan to do that. And it's a test of the heart of Job. 
And Job passes the test. He never stops loving God and, and trusting God, even though he doesn't understand. Job is not privy to the test that's going on. He doesn't understand that, that uh, God is not causing it to happen. And, and God's not doing it anything to him because he deserves it. He's he's been really sinful, and therefore God's punishing him. That's what that's what Job's friends are telling Job. And Job has is trying to figure out why is this all this happening to you? Why me? And, and uh, but it's testing Job's heart, and we all we all end up getting tested in our life. Um, have you ever gone through something really, really difficult where you felt it was a real test of your, your heart or your, and your faith? Yeah, Brother Luke, I think everybody has. Uh, that's why it's so important to have a godly heritage and to raise your children up to know the Lord because uh, it's very helpful to uh, uh, them. Uh, and, Going up through the life like that. Okay. All right, let's go on to, uh, let me see, verse four. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. So, if, if someone is a wicked person, they're always doing bad, wicked things. They, they don't mind listening to false lips, to people, to liars, and people that are saying bad things. Uh, they're willing to listen to them. And he says, a liar. If if you are a liar, you'll give it ear, or you'll listen to a naughty tongue. Uh, people who are speaking things that are bad. So uh, it, it's like, I guess, uh, some people, uh, they, they, uh, they're willing to listen to lies and, 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 and gossip and things because that's who they are too. They identify with it. They don't see anything wrong with it. Whereas what we should be doing is standing up against it so if someone is is uh, saying false things, uh, having a false false lips, we should stand up against it. Not we shouldn't give heed to it. Uh, if someone is saying bad things, uh, we 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 should not be uh, uh, keeping silent and 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 just condoning it. Brother, is that how you see that verse? Yes, brother, absolutely. Also, uh, there appears to be a sort of flow to that verse where it says, uh, a wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, a liar, and then that liar gives ear to a naughty tongue. So it's sort of going from a wicked doer to a false, to a liar, then to a liar to to a naughty tongue, uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, there's a continuity there. Uh, let me look at that in the uh, Amplified. Um, An evildoer listens closely to wicked lips, and a liar pays attention to a destructive and malicious tongue. So obviously, those are things we should not be doing. We should not be listening. Sorry, brother. The naughty tongue originates, and then it ends up as a wicked doer. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a cycle. <laughs> All right, let's go to the, uh, back to the KJV, verse 
5. Whoso mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker, and he that is glad at calamities shall not be unpunished. Wow. That, uh, that should stir up probably some guilty consciences among uh, some of us. Uh, have you ever been guilty of these kinds of things? Uh, mocked the poor? Uh, or uh, been glad at other people's misfortunes, their calamities, brother? Well, Brother Luke, uh, if we were all honest, to some degree, I think everyone is probably guilty of this to some degree. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a shameful thing, but I think you're right. I, I, I have to confess that there's there's times where I, I've, I don't want to know if I've actually mocked the poor, but I, I certainly have been understanding and sympathetic of the poor sometimes, not as, as I should. I mean, as we know that some people are poor because uh, they just choose to do the wrong thing all the time. They're either lazy or dishonest, or and, and the result is, is, is poverty. Um, and but there, there's there's a lot of people who are poor, particularly if we look outside of the United States. There's a lot of people poor all over the world that are. It's no fault of their own. It's not because they're not willing to work or desire they. They, uh, they they desire to do the right things and su succeed in life, and, and yet they're born into a situation that is so difficult that it's either impossible or almost impossible to rise out of it and escape that kind of poverty. And we should certainly have sympathy and, and, and be, try to help those people. Uh, and then the, the other second half of that, Verse. I can't remember what that said. Uh, and he that is glad at calamity shall not be unpunished. Uh, wow. That would be particularly, particularly uh, shameful when someone else has a, a calamity. A calamity would be, let's say that their, their house burns down. And there, there's an earthquake or something and everything they own is destroyed or, or that, their family is hit, T-boned in a car, and their family is all killed, and it's it, it's a calamity that comes upon them, and that we're glad that that happened to them. I mean, that would be pretty, pretty pretty horrible to have that kind of an attitude that you're happy about someone else's tragedy or, or calamity. I don't know. I, I I hope I've never been guilty of that. That seems to me a particularly shameful shameful thing, brother. What about that? Hey, Brother Luke, and that's where the Westboro Baptist Church is in violation of the royal law of love for uh, their activities in those areas, and we're calling them out on that. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Yeah, I think you've you picked a, an example of, of a group of people that certainly are about as despicable as they come. The, the, the hatefulness for of other people and their self-righteousness thinking that they're they're so much better than everybody else and and that it uh... all right let me go on to the next uh all right let's look at that uh, let's look at verse five in the amplified i forgot to do that verse five Whoever mocks the poor taunts his maker. So it, it's not only it's not only that you're uh, being you have a cruel attitude towards other people who are poor, but it is, it's an insult to God. Yeah, and he who rejoices at another's disaster will not go unpunished. That's quite a warning. Quite a warning. All right, let's. I'll go back now to the. KJV um, verse 6, seven, chapter 17, verse 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children 
are their fathers. Hmm. That, that could be, I mean, it, it, it really should be that way. Unfortunately, I, there's some people that they don't care about their children or their grandchildren. And there are some children that don't care about their parents or grandparents either. It's, that's really a, a sad when, when that happens, when these relationships within a family become either meaningless or there's just uh, disdain for each other. But uh, um, ideally, this should be the situation. But uh, uh, I have one son. He's 35. I don't have any grandchildren yet. I certainly desire it, but uh, I, I would feel that way. It, that I have a great desire for some grandchildren, and 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 then the glory of the children of their fathers. Uh, uh, I never, I never even met any of my grandparents. Obviously, I have four grandparents, or I had them, but I've never met a single one of them. They, and that I've always. I've always felt like I missed out not ever knowing my grandparents. But uh, how, how do you see this verse, brother? Do you relate to it? Uh, oh, absolutely, brother Luke. And it saddens me greatly to hear that uh, you neither have grandchildren nor have seen your grandparents. To the next verse here that's pretty self-explanatory uh verse seven excellent speech becometh not a fool much less do lying lips a prince <laughs> okay does that mean that a fool does not have excellent speech or it says becometh not a fool uh much less do lying lips a prince um it just doesn't seem to go together. If you're a fool, you probably don't have excellent speech. Um, if you're a prince, you uh, you should not. It's just not. It's not right that a prince should just be a liar. But uh, I found that, uh, from my knowledge of history, that someone who's a, a royal uh, doesn't mean that they have. Uh, you know, uh, char good character and, uh, uh, you know, they have ad admirable qualities necessarily. You know, there are certainly people who are come from a royal family line that uh, are not, not uh, admirable people at all. Brother, what about verse 7 there? Well, it makes perfect sense to me, Brother Luke. Uh, uh, Ain't no liar. The, the king will not uh, trust any liar. No king wants a liar around him, so he certainly won't have him uh, be what a prince. Okay. All right. I'm going to look at that in the amplified. Uh, let me see. Excellent speech does not benefit a fool who is spiritually blind. Much less do lying lips benefit a prince. Hmm. Well, that's that's another way of looking at that verse. Uh, Excellent speech does not benefit a fool who is spiritually blind. Let me look at that again in the KJV. Becometh not a fool. Excellent speech becometh not a fool. Okay, it says becometh not, and then the Amplified it says does not benefit. So that's how they see the, the term becometh not. Much less uh, do lying lips benefit a prince. What do you think of that translation? Okay, let's go with that. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay. All right. So now let's go back to uh, the next verse in the KJV. Uh, verse 8, a gift is as a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Wh whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. Well, maybe if I read it more slowly, it'll make sense to me. A gift is as a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. So that means that a person that has a, received a gift should value, would value it. A whithersoever it turneth, I don't even know what whithersoever really means. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, brother, take a shot at that one before I go to the Amplified. I think I understand this one perfectly because uh, I like to give out my silver bullets from the Lone Ranger. And when people get these, they'll be looking at it all over and they'll be all excited. What is it? What is it? And that's what it's like to receive a gift. It's like a shiny stone. No matter how you turn it, it's going to shine. Now, I, I remember before we went with the live broadcast, you and I were talking for a few minutes, and you talked to explain to me what you meant by the silver bullet, but but I, I don't think the audience knows what you mean. Why don't you explain to them what the silver bullet is and how you use it? Well, uh, the silver bullet is a dollar bill. And inside that dollar bill that's rolled up is a Seven Thunders Gospel Tract. And inside the Seven Thunders Gospel Tract is the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, along with that good news of Jesus Christ is seven salvation verses chosen out of the Bible that... Uh, sound like thunder okay back to you brother Luke. well brother I, uh, you're the only person i've ever known I mean, maybe there are other people do it in in the same way you do it but i i've never met anybody else that at the same time they pass out a tract they're passing out money a, a, a dollar a dollar is not a large sum of money but it, it's a gesture showing that hey uh, not only do you want them to have uh, the good news about jesus and the gift of eternal life but you're even pulling willing to at a cost to yourself take money out of your pocket to give them so that they will be blessed and maybe curious way well, hey, someone's giving me free money well and then they look inside and maybe they're more likely to actually read that track and consider it because they see that not only did you give them the track but you cared enough to even give them a dollar and the dollars add up if you're passing out very many of those it it, it adds up so that's that's a really interesting um uh thing you're um, approach that you take to your uh, your passing out tracks and evangelism it's uh i've never heard anybody doing that before but i i, I like the whole concept okay i'm going to look at this in the amplified um verse eight it says a bribe is like a bright precious stone in the eyes of its owner <laughs> okay <laughs> wherever he turns he prospers i remember when we were talking last time about a gift uh and uh, you said you thought it was a bribe and it turned out in the amplified that's the word that they use too and this time we didn't think of it in that way but um, the Amplified is saying that this gift is a bribe. 
A bribe is like a bright, precious stone in the eyes of its owner. Wherever he turns, he prospers. I'm still kind of at a loss for that, brother, but uh, let me read it slowly in the Amplified and then let me get your reaction to it. A bribe is like a bright, precious stone in the eyes of its owner. Wherever he turns, he prospers. What do you think that? Uh, Brother Luke, I, I don't know what the author was thinking when he wrote that particular amplification. Okay, I'm going to read it again in the KJV. It says, a gift is as a precious stone in, uh, in the eyes of him that hath it. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. Well, no matter what translation we look at, I'm not, I don't claim that I really am confident in understanding that verse there. But I'm going to look at verse 9 in the KJV. It says, he that covereth a transgression seeketh love. But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. What does it mean to cover a transgression? Go ahead, brother, if you got an answer for that. Oh, brother, I was going to say that uh, Jesus' blood, uh, Jesus' blood not only covers us, it uh, washes us clean. And uh, I could reconcile that to Jesus Christ myself. I believe we all could. Yeah, if we apply it to Jesus in the cross, he that covereth a transgression. Um, well, Jesus' blood covers our transgressions. He paid for our sins with his death on the cross. And it says he seeks love. Well, that really is what God seeks with us. Uh, he, he, wants, he wants us to love him. He does love us. And the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. He loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. He loves us so much that in, uh, it says he commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And uh, uh, Jesus said there is no greater love than being willing to give your life for someone. So, uh, yeah, I, I can see how this verse could be certainly applied to salvation. Now, but this is the next part. But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. I have no idea what that means. He that repeateth a matter. Is that someone that let's say you've you've done a transgression and you've been forgiven and then you and then someone goes along and repeats it and does the same thing back to you again? And, you know, you've, you've not only been forgiven, but now you're repeating it again. Uh, no, brother, not necessarily. What it means is uh, he that uh, repeated the matter is telling something, telling uh, telling uh, the, a matter to somebody else and then causing a division in that way. Yeah, that does make sense. Let me see if the Amplified agrees with that. Let me look at this. Okay, it says, at the Amplified, says, he who covers and forgives an offense seeks love. Okay, so that would apply. That's what Jesus did for us, and, and that's what we should do. We should forgive and, uh, uh, you know, because we desire to, we want to love everybody. We, uh, as Jesus said, uh, the royal law is to love each other. And it says, but he who repeats or gossips about a matter separates intimate friends. Brother, you, you nailed it according to the, the Amplified. 
Well done. Uh, thank you, Brother Luke. It's always a pleasure to correct you. <laughs> it's uh, it's always a pleasure to be corrected. I uh, I've learned one thing. I mean, I, I, there's there's some things in life I'm sure that uh, I certainly need to be corrected. But one thing I, I have learned is that I welcome correction you know, because I don't want to be wrong. I mean, if I'm wrong, let me know. The last thing I want to do is, is remain wrong. There's a saying that I like. I've said it numerous times in videos. It said that uh, uh, only a fool would hold on to their errors once they've been exposed. Uh, so, yeah, if I'm wrong on anything, uh, you know, I don't be shy about telling me. Now, if you tell me I'm wrong, I'm not obligated to change my mind and, and say, well, you're right and I was wrong. But I, I am obligated to at least listen to you, consider it the possibility that maybe I'm wrong and, and, and in that way, because I would be just be lying to myself and, and cheating myself from the truth. If, if I would close my mind and say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. All right, brother. Um, so let's, uh, let me go on now to the next verse. KJV. Um, verse 10. Uh, a reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. Hmm. Well, I think that's pretty clear, but let me hear your response to that. Yes, Brother Luke, I think you just uh, perfectly exemplified that verse in our previous discourse. Yeah, it, cer it certainly does apply. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it is wise to, to listen. Uh, over and over again through Proverbs, we're told to, if you're wise, you'll listen, you'll accept correction, you'll, you'll entertain counselors and, and uh, um, be, be happy to, to learn and, from others and, and be corrected. And, uh, it says, but a fool it does, isn't, it doesn't behave in that way. I mean, you can take a fool doesn't want to listen. Even a hundred stripes, you can whip them a hundred times. And it doesn't, they're, just, they're not going to learn anything. They're not going to accept correction. Even if you beat them with a whip, a whip. Let's look at that in the, in the amplified, uh, verse 10, a reprimand goes deeper into one who has understanding and a teachable spirit than a hundred lashes into a fool. <laughs> All right. The interesting thing is that uh, I've never understood one thing here that maybe you can help me with this. Um, Jesus says, don't call any man rabbi. Uh, you have one teacher. And it's it's Jesus, and and, and, he, and the, the, but he also says, don't call any man fool, or I think the word is raka, and it means fool. Uh, I, I don't remember what he says the consequence of that would be, but I think it was uh, you 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 go to hell or something. Uh, but uh, the apostle Paul. Uh, he calls people fools. I mean, for example, how about the foolish Galatians? Uh, so I, I've never been able to reconcile those two ideas. And yet, of course, we also see in Proverbs, it's, 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 it's in all the chapters of Proverbs. I mean, you, we've probably seen the word fool already. We're halfway through the book of Proverbs. And already, I bet you we've seen the, the, the word fool show up at least a hundred times. So um, what is it I don't understand about Jesus's admonition to not call anyone a fool? And do you understand that? 
Uh, yes, Brother Luke, uh, maybe I can shed some light on that for you. Now, Jesus never uh, commanded uh, not to call a fool. He actually stated he who calls somebody a fool will be in danger of the judgment. So it's okay to go ahead and call somebody a fool as long as you know you'll be in danger of the judgment. All right. Thank you, brother. Now, that, that does make perfect sense now. Thank you. See, that's something that I've been saved for 29 years. It took me 29 years to, to learn that, and thank you very much. Very good. Um, all right, let's go back to the KJV. Um, this is verse 11. An, uh, an evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. <laughs> wow. Now that's something to make you think twice. Brother? I think God put that in there. I think he's telling the man of this world, he's sending him a message. He's telling him that there's a cool messenger coming for you, man of this world. Yeah, but I would, I could take this in a, in a much broader sense, uh, an evil man seek of rebellion but um isaiah says all all we like sheep have gone astray everyone has turned to his own way and so when we go astray we turn to our own way instead of god's way that's rebellion uh i, I see every single person as a rebel we've all rebelled against god and thought you know are we know better than god and we what we all need to do is come to our senses repent and that means to come to your senses and change your mind and realize the truth that wait a second uh, god's way is better than my way uh, and god's way is is trusting him don't lean on my own understanding but rely upon jesus christ instead so uh, i see that all of us are rebels we've all rebelled and therefore this Thing is all going to come for after all of us. There's consequences that, that are coming for all of us. The consequence cited here is a cruel messenger. <laughs> yeah, we've we've all got a cruel messenger coming our way because there are consequences for man's rebellion. One consequence, of course, is death. We all die in the first death, our our bodies and. And then those people who never get born again and get um, eternal life, they're destined to die the second death in the lake of fire. Now, that's quite a cruel messenger. The messenger is death. And it's all because of our rebellion, thinking that we don't need God. We, 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 we can figure this out on our own. We can do, go our own way. Uh, that's how I see it the, when it talks about rebellion. That's the thoughts that come to my mind, brother. What about you? I love the way you tie that into the gospel. That's brilliant. Thank you, brother. Okay, so now let's go to, uh, I might as well look at that in the uh, Amplified. Uh, verse 11. Um, a rebellious man seeks only evil, therefore the cruel messenger will be sent against him. All right, there's nothing new in that. Okay, so KJV, verse 12, let a man, let a, a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. <laughs> oh, man. A fool in his folly.
brother, or is, have you ever encountered any fools? Uh, and um, can you admit that you've ever been a fool? Oh, Brother Luke, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> I was wondering when you were going to ask me that question. Uh, oh, absolutely, Brother Luke. And that's why it's so important to uh, walk in the spirit and not walk in the flesh and uh, be a fool, play the fool, because uh, it's uh, worse than meeting a bear robbed of her wealth, according to Scripture. So it's a very bad thing to be in violation of the royal law of love. Okay, so we all got to walk in love. Uh because uh, the, the alternative is uh, not good at all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and now that you've enlightened me about using the word fool, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feel much more comfortable, you, you know, discussing this uh, concept of, of fools. And, and uh, I know that, uh, I think if we're going to all be honest with ourselves, we we, we are all fools sometimes. And, and the, the, what we hope to do is um, mature spiritually. And, and, and as we mature and get more wisdom, then we do less foolish things in our life. But we, every time we've done something foolish, I hope everyone watching can admit that, hey, come on, you've done some foolish things. And... Uh, so it's our goal to, to gain wisdom and leave the foolish things behind. Um, Paul says that talked about that maturing about when he was a child, he behaved as a child, and, but, but now he's left these childish things behind. These things you do when you're childish and immature and you, you do foolish things. Okay, brother, I'll move on. Anything else on that before we go on? Brother Luke. Okay. Uh, th verse 13, whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. That's a, that's a pretty st good warning. Uh, yeah. If someone is doing good and you pay them back with evil someone treats you well and you treat them mistreat them uh don't think you're going to get away with it evil shall not depart from your house you know the it gets back to that the law of reaping and sowing again and sometimes it's just the law that that, that applies to you whether you're a saved person or a lost person you cannot escape the law of reaping and sowing uh, when you do bad things, you're going to get bad consequences coming back into your life. And, uh, and then sometimes it's not even the law of reaping and sowing, but it's, it's the chastisement of God. Um, those of us who are Christians, we're, as a child of God, uh, our, our, our Father God will discipline us and chastise us when we get out of line. So I don't think that, uh, you know, if you do bad things, you're going to get away with it. Brother? Well, Brother Luke, uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, this verse strikes fear in my heart, and uh, it also reminds me of what uh, David did to Bathsheba's husband, and oddly enough, it's verse number 13. Yeah. <laughs> now, what's the origin of the the number thirteen uh, being like? You know, thirteen's an unlucky number, a number to fear. Uh, matter of fact, there's a word for someone who fears the number thirteen. It's called trescadecophobia, fear of the number thirteen. Jack Smack would be proud of me for knowing that that word, I guess. But. Uh, um, 
Do you, do you, do you know the origin of uh, the number 13 being a bad number? Oh, yes, Brother Luke, I do. And uh, 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 if you did, you did look into it, uh, you would be amazed. Uh, it said that uh, Jesus was crucified on Friday the 13th. Uh, the Templars were betrayed on Friday the 13th. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, maybe you might want to look into that. And uh, there were there were thirteen at that last supper. Um, yes, brother Luke, I suspect you know more about this than you're letting on to. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to move on to verse fourteen now. And the beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. Whew. Another Rubik's Cube of the English language. Verse 14, brother. Can you, can you explain that one to me? Uh, I think that's where they're talking about just nipping it in the bud. Uh, uh, so when strike starts, maybe a soft answer, turning away wrath would... Uh, prevent the uh, flood of contention. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think you're maybe right on that. Let's see if the Amplified agrees with that. Let's see, 14. Um, the beginning of strife is like letting out water as from a small break in a dam, first it trickles and then it gushes. Therefore, abandon the quarrel before it breaks out and tempers explode. Hmm. Yeah, that's just the way you were saying it. Uh... Wow, I wrote the Amplified version today. <laughs> Yeah, well done. Um, and it's, it, you know, certainly uh, it's, it's, it's a great lesson for us to learn. And uh, the, nipping it in the bud, as you say, uh, don't let it get out of hand. And, and I'm reminded by what Jesus said, too. He says, that if, you, if you have a disagreement with your, with your brother and don't make an offer at the temple, uh, you know, go, go before you make your offer, first go resolve the problem with your brother. Uh, the, the, the offering is not, not important uh, compared to resolving your problem. So um, that, that's what we should try to do. Um, there's another one. I think it's in Proverbs. I don't think we've come to it yet, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't it say that don't let the sun go down? If you have a conflict with someone, don't go let the sun go down before you've attempted to resolve it. Uh, that's in the epistle somewhere. Uh, Bill would know exactly where that's at. Yeah. I hope uh, Brother Bill watches this to see how many times you're, you're citing him. And... Uh, uh, Okay, let's go to uh, uh, 17, next verse is, um, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. That's pretty clear cut right there, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, Brother Luke. It also reminds me of uh, verse uh, uh, 11, where uh, evil will not depart from uh, his house. Oh, verse 13. Yeah, and that, 
It's every once in a while we have a verse that's so clear that it doesn't require much explanation. Um, if you justify wicked people, wicked actions, uh, uh, or if you if you're condemning the people that you know good, good things and good people, then uh, God doesn't like it. God's not happy with with you, and you're, you know abomination uh, means he actually hates it. It's something he hates. Um, I've said it before. There was a poem that that uh, I read at the um, when I was a young person. We, my family and I we we used to always have family time together where we'd recite poetry as a family. And there was one poem I particularly liked, titled "Dried Apple Pies." And there's one line in it that says, "I loathe, I abhor." I detest, I despise, I abominate dried apple pies. <laughs> All of those words, of course, mean hate. It's a very powerful ways of expressing how much you hate something. So when it says, even they both are abomination to the Lord, I mean, God certainly hates it when uh, we try to justify the wicked things and, and, and when we are condemning things that are, are righteous. Brother? Amen to that, Brother Luke. His love just doesn't do those things. Okay. Have you ever had dried apple pies? Do you know how much how bad they are? I have not, Brother Luke. Uh, maybe we can try them sometime. Yeah, I don't know. I've never, I mean, I like apple pie, but maybe this dried apple pie is, uh, you know, it, it's just old. I don't know. I don't really know what dried apple pie is, but the writer of that poem certainly hated it. Okay, um, verse 16. There, wherefore is there a price in the, in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? Hmm. Another example of me not getting it with a, I need to have a look at the Amplified. What do you think of that verse 16? Okay, Brother Luke, that's obviously talking about Levi Christ, that false gospel preacher. And, uh, we're calling him out too because he's a work salvationist and uh that's not what scripture teaches okay thank you for the week. okay um i i don't know levi price much uh yeah i don't know much about him there certainly are uh, we could probably rattle off a lot of names of very famous prominent uh televangelists and people on the radio and television that are famous and unfortunately um, the more famous they are the more likely that it seems that they're teaching a false message it's just, it's very very sad to me that uh, uh, the people who are preaching the truth uh, for the most part they're they're uh, insignificant in, in 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 terms of their audience whereas the people who have the big audiences are all teaching uh heresy um but let me look at this verse 16 in the amplified why is there money in the hand of a fool to buy wisdom when he has no common sense or even a heart for it well, that's pretty easy to understand. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the the guy that uh, wanted to buy the Holy Spirit from, was it Peter or Paul? Uh, who was that guy that he was? Was it Simon Magus or, that wanted to buy the Holy Spirit? Yeah, Brother Luke, I think his name was Simon. I think you're absolutely correct. He wanted he wanted to buy the Holy Spirit, and that's an insult, you know, to the whole idea that it's free. 
And, and if you try to buy it uh, or work for it or earn it, then you've nullified it. It's a gift. It's no longer a gift if you buy it. And so uh, uh, it's the same kind of thing here, how foolish it would be for someone to try to buy wisdom. Um, okay, let's look at uh, back to the KJV. I'm sorry. Verse... Uh, Verse 17, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Wow, I like that. A friend loveth at all times. Brother, I don't know this. Uh, yeah, I kind of think of you when I read that part of that. Uh, you, you, you have um, continued to bring me back to the royal law all the time. It's your, I think it's one of your main missions uh, is to keep bringing that to our mind. Uh, and a brother is born for adversity. Uh, in other words, uh, put uh, someone who is your brother is going to, that's who you want there. You want them with you when there's adversity because you know that they'll be faithful and that they will uh, help you get through the adversity. Verse 17, brother, what do you say? Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Brother Luke, for uh, shining that spotlight on me, which is not actually on me, but which is on Christ, uh, who's shining his light through me. And uh, Praise God for that. And, and interestingly, uh, that second half of that verse, your interpretation, I never quite resolved it in that manner. Having uh, had a brother and had sons, multiple sons, uh, it seemed to me that adversity uh, was often uh, the case between brothers. Okay, back to you. Uh, let's look at this in the Amplified and see if it, my take on it is agrees with the Amplified or not. Let's see, Amplified, verse. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Okay, it doesn't really expound upon it at all, but I think it's... Uh, I can certainly see how it agrees with the KJV. Um, let's go back to the KJV now into the, uh, let me see, 16. Verse 18, a man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. Wow. He certainly does lack understanding to do that. A man void of understanding, a man who does not uh, understand how foolish it is. By striking hands, that means you, you're shaking hands on a deal. You're saying, okay, you're uh, becoming surety. Uh, you're you're co-signing. You're, you're, you're making yourself responsible for someone else's uh, promise or, or debt. Uh, he says, you're void of understanding if you do that. Brother, verse 18. Absolutely, Brother Luke. And then again, in the presence of his friend. Uh, what is that referring to? Is that referring to the one he is uh, striking the surety debt with? Or is that his friend viewing the whole matter? That I want to look at the Amplified and see if that helps us with that part of it. Let me see. Um, a man lacking common sense gives a pledge and becomes a guarantor for the debt of another in the presence of his neighbor. Hmm. Um, yeah, 
it seems like he's talking about the, the last person who's just being kind of a witness to it all. All right, let's go on to the, uh, uh, let me see. The next verse in the KJV. Oh, uh, where am I here? Verse 19. 17, 19. Okay. Yeah, thank you. He, he loveth transgression that loveth strife. And he that exalteth his gate seeketh destruction. Well, he loveth transgression that loveth strife. Uh, uh, transgression and strife are very much like cousins to each other uh, he that exalteth his gate seeketh destruction uh, that's is is that walking with pride uh, exalteth his gate Wait. yeah I would say so all right let's look at 19 in the amplified and see if it agrees He who loves transgression, loves strife, and is quarrelsome. He who proudly raises his gate seeks destruction because of his arrogant pride. Okay. All right. We got that one right, I think. Uh, now we go to verse 20 in the KJV. He that hath a froward heart findeth no good, and he that hath a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. Well, he certainly is telling us you better not have a froward heart, which is mean that you're perverse, you're disagreeable. You're not gonna, no good's gonna come to you if that's what you're like. He that has a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. You know, if your tongue is perverse, you're lying and you're 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 saying um, bad things all the time. You're going to end up getting into trouble over it. Anything you want to add to that? No, I would just like to concur with every all of that. Okay, verse twenty-one: He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. Oh, gosh. <laughs> wow. When it says begetteth a fool, I think that's relating to being a father, too. Again, uh, he that begetteth a fool, in other words, if you have a son or a child that's a fool, you're going to be, it's going to make you really sad. And it just basically is repeating the same thing. The father of a fool hath no joy. Is that, you think that's correct? Uh, yes, it's absolutely correct, Brother Luke, and it's a good thing that we could both uh, laugh at that because, uh, unfortunately, there's many people that uh, can't laugh at that verse, and uh, I pray for them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, very, very true. I've, I've talked about my son uh, numerous times throughout this study of Proverbs as an example of how uh, proud I am. He's... 35 years old and he's uh he's very wise 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 beyond his years uh far more wise and advanced than than i was at that age it's uh, i'm just very very happy i don't have to suffer uh because because uh, i have a foolish son i and i don't have, my son is not foolish so I'm, I'm blessed and i do i feel i feel for those people who have children that are foolish and getting into mischief and causing their parents grief. Uh, verse 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. That's a beautiful saying, brother. What do you say on that? Yes, brother, I think for absolutely. I've, I've talked before about the uh, 
uh, the idea of uh, smiling, laughing, being uh, having a good attitude, a positive attitude. Uh, these things are not only good for one's health, but they're good for your friends and family's health because uh, if, if people uh, smile at me, it's like they're giving me a, a vitamin B12 shot. It's just like, oh, I just feel so much better when someone smiles at me. Uh, it's a blessing to me when they smile, they're friendly. Uh, and and, and if, if we are a, a joyful person, if we have a positive attitude about life as a whole, if we even smile, it does improve our health. It says, you, you, if, you, if you're not joyful, you, it dries up your bones. Uh, that means you're, you're not going to be healthy. Um, there's a, something I learned. From, they did a scientific study and, and said that when a person smiles, it actually causes the brain um, as a chemical reaction in your brain where endomorphins are released in your brain. And endomorphins give us a state of happiness. And if you smile or a laugh, even if you smile and you're not even, it's a real smile. Like if I'm smiling and I'm really happy, obviously I get happy because the morphines are going off in my brain. But, but even if it's not a real smile, just the fact that the corners of our mouth are moving upward, e even though I'm forcing it, lifting up my corners of my mouth, my brain doesn't know that it's not even real. As soon as that happens, the brain thinks I'm smiling and I get happy. Just try it. Just f smile and you'll immediately feel happy. So I, it, it's, it's really sad when I pe see people walking around with frowns on their face. and uh, You know, it just, it's just it's so easy to cause a state of happiness just by forcing yourself to smile. It, it's, it's amazing how it works. You ever tried that, brother? Oh, that's just wonderful news, brother Luke. I think we can go somewhere with that. Okay. I'm going to look into that further. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, a wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. And now, could this be another, another uh, use of the word gift that means bribe in this case? A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. Brother, what do you say about that? 20 verse 23 uh yeah i'm not quite sure but it, it sort of reminds me of the phrase taking candy from a baby okay i'm going to look at it in the amplify and see if it helps verse uh, 23 a wicked man receives a bribe from the hidden pocket to pervert the ways of justice. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's pretty plain there. Uh, the concept of bribery is an ancient concept. I mean, here we are in the, the 21st century and uh, the idea of bribery is, is not some just new modern in, invention. It's, 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 a, it's an ancient idea of bribing people. And he talks about how a, a wicked man receives a bribe uh, to pervert justice. I mean, it's still very pr prevalent today. This, this thing goes on today. Let's look at verse 24 in the KJV. Wisdom is before him that hath understanding, but the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. 
wisdom is before him that hath understanding but the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth i don't know what that last phrase means but the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth uh, after we do this verse here we're going to close the show here but uh, go ahead and tell me if you understand verse 24 brother I do not, Brother Luke. Uh, I think he referred to the amplified version. Okay, let's go look at that and see if it helps. <coughs> Verse 24 it says, uh, Skillful and godly wisdom is in the presence of a person of understanding, and he recognizes it. But the eyes of a thick headed fool are on the ends of the earth. The eyes of a thick-headed fool are on the ends of the earth. So he's looking out to the, end of the ends of the earth because he's foolish. I don't. I still don't get it. All right, we don't get it all. Um, we uh, one of the things that we need to understand about wisdom is that none of us understand everything if, if 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 you do not realize that you are fallible unlike this this guy that just came to america and that millions of people got all excited about him. his name's uh, dope francis he's the the leader of the roman catholic cult dope francis um they say he's infallible, but all people are fallible. And we all make mistakes. None of us have perfect understanding. And, and that's one of the things we need to, 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 to accept in order to be wise is that uh, there's uh, 66 books that make up the Bible. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. And out of all of this, how much do I really understand? Well, you've seen just today in this study here on Proverbs, there's some verses that we're not certain that we really understand it. Sometimes there's a verse that we don't, we just confess, I just don't understand it at all. Uh, how arrogant, how egotistical would it be for someone to, to claim they understand every verse, every word perfectly? If that's how you feel, if that's how you are, then that's it's mind boggling. But there are people that are that conceited and arrogant that think they've got it all right. Uh, so I guess the one thing we can learn by studying Proverbs and on the, all the scriptures is that sometimes we're going to be stumped, but thankfully, the the main message of the Bible is clear and simple and easy to understand, and that's what we want to talk about in the remaining few few minutes we have left today, and that is the the question of how does a, a person how is a person able to enjoy eternal life in heaven? Do, do you want to go to heaven? I'm talking to the viewing audience here. Do you want to go to heaven? You know, we all, we all accept the fact that someday we're going to die. And most people believe after they die, there is some afterlife. Well, the way the Bible teaches us is that we die and then we go to the, the judgment and those people who believed in Jesus go to the judgment seat of Christ and because they put their faith in Jesus they are they are declared are righteous and they have eternal life and we get judged just to see what kind of treasures we're going to have in heaven because of the the ministry that we how we serve Jesus after we put our faith in him. But those people who did never put their faith in Jesus, 
they go to a great white throne judgment and all those people are not going to be judged uh, uh, for their faith in Jesus. And they never put their faith in Jesus. So they don't have eternal life and their lives are going to be judged. And um, they, they, they also have an afterlife. Uh, Brother Eric and I, we, our afterlife is going to be um, uh, eternal life in the kingdom of God. Heaven and earth will be coming together. It's called a new heaven, a new earth. And we will live in paradise on earth with God and with all those who put their faith in Jesus. We're going to live together here forever with joy and bliss and happiness. No more sickness, no more pain, no more death. That's what we have to look forward to because we put our faith in Jesus. But all the people who never put their faith in Jesus, they go to that judgment and they, they're they found uh, guilty. They're guilty of unbelief they never believed in jesus and his promises so therefore what they have to look forward to the bible calls the second death the second death is the lake of fire so that's uh, uh that's that's the question uh, do you do you want to go to heaven on earth and have eternal life. And if you do want to do that, if you if you believe that there is an afterlife and that you can go to heaven, well, what do you have to do? What is required of you? Most people think that what God requires of them is, is they've got to perform well. They've got to, they've got to excel in life. They've got to be a good person. They've, they've got to be religious. They've got to be better than the average person. And, and uh, you know, and, and somehow if they're good enough, God will accept them and approve them and they get to go to heaven. But the Bible says that's not God's way. If you read Romans chapter 10, verse 3, it says man's way is trying to establish his own righteousness. But that's not God's way. God's way is accepting the fact that we don't have righteousness unless we put our faith in Jesus. We need the righteousness of Jesus credited to us. So if you're trying to get to heaven through man's way, through personal merit, you're going to fail because the Bible says that's impossible. Jesus said it is impossible. Uh, Bible says that try to get there by working your way to heaven. It says, we all fall short. You can strive and work and become religious, trying to work your way to heaven, and you're going to always fall short. So you can take that approach if you want, but it's doomed to failure. Or you can take the approach that the Bible says that you must take, and that is surrender and say, I give up. I cannot do it. I'm, I'm in a helpless, hopeless situation. I need someone to save me. And the Bible says there is a Savior, but there's only one. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus not only claimed that he was the Savior, but he says he's the one and only Savior, the only way to go to hell. So if you're watching this now, what we want you to understand is that uh, Throughout history, man has believed that the way to heaven is through personal merit. And what we're telling you today is that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the only way to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to ask Brother Eric a couple of questions and I, because we want you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. So I want you to know a little bit about him. First, let me ask Brother Eric. Who is Jesus? When Jesus asked the apostles, who do you say that I am? What is the answer? Who is this Jesus we're asking them to trust? Okay, Brother Luke, uh, Jesus is the Lamb of God, God's perfect sacrifice for mankind, who was slain from the foundations of the world. Okay, thank you, 
Okay, so when you say he's the Lamb of God, this is a Jewish way of, of describing uh, the idea that in Judaism, they would sacrifice a lamb, they did animal sacrifices as a symbolic way of, of showing that there must be a death, there must be bloodshed for the payment of our mankind's sins. These were all these rituals, all these sacrifices the Jewish people did were a, just a shadow of something that was to come in the future. And that is that God would provide his son, Jesus Christ, as a lamb, as a sacrifice. Jesus said he was the a ransom. He came to give his life as a ransom for mankind. So uh, who is Jesus? He is God Almighty who became a man named Jesus Christ as known as the Son of God and the Lamb of God who would die for our sins. So Jesus paid for all of our sins. That's the, what we want you to understand. He suffered and died on that cross. But the good news is the grave could not hold him down. Brother, what happened? What happened on the third day? Well, Brother Luke, after Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, according to scriptures, he was buried in the tomb, and he rose again on the third day. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Yeah, the, 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 the gospel, which means the good news that we want to understand is that not only did Jesus die on the cross and pay for our sins, so that we can have eternal life in heaven, but death could not get the victory over him because he being God has power over life and death. And he said that he would do, give us a sign to prove who he is and to prove what he was doing, what he did was successful. He said that he would raise himself from the dead on the third day and he did it three days in the tomb then he raised himself from the dead, and then he, he walked among us. Among us, he, he showed himself to the apostles. He showed himself to his brother, James. He, he showed himself to 300 people at one time. He ate with them. They touched him. They felt him. He proved to them that he raised himself back to life bodily, and he did that so that we can be confident and feel justified that faith in him was the right thing to do, was the, what was needed. And this resurrection is what he called the first fruit. In other words, he raised himself from the dead and he promised that he's going to raise you and me and all of us from the dead so that we can be resurrected to eternal life when he comes again. So that's what we have to look forward to. And that's what we call in the scriptures as the gospel, the good news. The good news is that God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that uh, by believing in him, by believing in that he paid for our sins. He raised himself from the dead. He has the power over life and death. Putting our faith in him for our salvation instead of trying to work our way to heaven our, on our own merit. By believing in him, we will not perish in the lake of fire or suffer the second death. Instead, we will have life everlasting in the kingdom of God. So, all that's really required of you, if you want this eternal life in the kingdom of God, if you want to go to heaven, what is required of you is one thing. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you want to please God, put your faith in Jesus now. No longer put your faith in your own ability. Reject that as a, as a heresy, as a false gospel. Reject personal merit and instead, Put your faith in Jesus and trust him to get you to heaven. And if we put your faith in him completely, he immediately puts the Holy Spirit of God inside you, 
you become a child of God and you never have to worry because he promises you're going to go to heaven and you can trust him. He'll, he'll, he'll never break his promise. He'll never change his mind. So you can be assured and be joyful. Brother, any last thing to say before we end the broadcast? Thank you so much for inviting me, Brother Luke, and for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, which is available to everyone for forgiveness of sins and new life in Christ Jesus. Okay. All right. Brother Eric, I want to thank you for joining me today. And uh, uh, to the, the viewing audience, uh, I hope you'll join me every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time for uh, another broadcast of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. I'll pick up uh, next Wednesday where we left off here in, uh, in the book of Proverbs. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. Bye-bye.